أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول صلاة
حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى النبي الأمين أبا القاسم خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمعين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى صحبه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغيثه ونستنصره فإنه حق من هدى الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له اللهم يا رحمن يا رحيم يا علي يا عظيم يا رب العالمين اللهم نسألك يا رب أن تقسم لنا من خشيتك ما يحول بيننا وبين معاصيك ونسألك يا رب أن تقسم لنا من رحمتك ما يقربنا من طاعتك ونسألك يا رب أن ترزقنا من اليقين ما يهون علينا مصائب الدنيا وأحداثها يا الله الله سبحانه وتعالى repeatedly warns us in the Quran from warns us using utilizing a phrase that should mean a great deal to all of us that should be embedded in our very consciousness. And Allah repeatedly warns us against al-fasad fi al-ard. Quite simply, causing corruption on this earth. And Surah Al-Rum, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس لنذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون و 
that indeed you will always find on earth the signs of human corrupting existence. The fingerprints of corruption caused by human beings. And in Surah Rum, Allah reminds us that these instances of corruption, instances or patterns, depending on how much, where, and when, in fact, it's clear evidence of what people's hands have sold, what people themselves have earned, the suffering that they have caused, and the suffering that they suffer. And that through it all, it only becomes meaningful if these instances of corruption and suffering become a path for people to remember and to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But doesn't Allah in Surah Hud doesn't Allah warned us فَلَوْ لَا كَانَ مِنَ الْقُرُونَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ أُلُوا بَقِيَّةٍ يَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْفَسَادِ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِمَّنْ أَنْجَيْنَا إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِمَّنْ أَنْجَيْنَا مِنْهُمْ وَاتَّبَعُوا وَاتَّبَعَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مَا أُتْرِفُوا فِيهِ وَكَانُوا مُجْرِمِينَ doesn't Allah remind us of a reality that what maintains the balance of existence, what allows, in fact, life to persist and for what we commonly refer to as social life, or civil life to exist is always a minority of people, a minority that embody humans' consciousness, become the living conscious of humanity. It's more minority that always battle evil, always stand up to evil, and fight it, and resist it. But what follows in Surah Hud is so fascinating. Allah tells us that the unjust, which the context clearly shows is the majority. The unjust always follow the vain. Ma utrifu fi. The, their very criminality is their indulgence. It is not that they are an evil folk in a caricature of evil in old Hollywood movies of people laughing maniacally and intending and intending to do maniacal things. No. The unjust majority are unjust because of their indulgences. Ma utrifu fi. 
they have gotten accustomed to taking care of number one. They've gotten accustomed to taking care of themselves. They've gotten accustomed to thinking of their own problems and their own comforts, of what they personally, individually, want and desire. That is the majority. The majority knows that there is evil and knows that there is corruption on earth. But they think if they simply ignore it and focus on their own lives, everything will be okay. In reality, their neglect is nothing short of criminal. It is criminal because the very persistence of life on this earth, the very persistence of any measure of civility, morality, ethics, goodness, beauty, relies and depends on the small minority that dedicates itself to warding off evil, fighting evil, and insisting on a firm footing in goodness. The criminality of the majority is that they are leeches, they are free riders, they enjoy the fruit of that minority that sacrifices everything in order for life to be maintained and existence to persist. How how much it is remarkable the extent to which Muslims need the lessons of their own Quran if only if only they would re-educate themselves as Muslims and commit themselves all over again as Muslims. Recently, yet once again, The United States and Britain bomb, destroy, and kill, this time, Muslims in Yemen. Of course, we didn't need to go through the facade they didn't go to the Security Council. The rules of the game that the United States and Britain established, the United Nations Charter, which these two countries played the pioneering role in drafting. According to the UN Charter, you cannot use violence as a form of self-help. According to the rules established by the United States and Britain, in the Charter, 
you are supposed to take a problem to the Security Council. And the Security Council is supposed to act either under one chapter of the Charter in an advisory capacity or under another chapter in the Charter in a compulsory capacity. But the rules of the game that the US and Britain established is that you go to the Security Council, you complain to the Security Council about a breach of peace, in Islamic terms, a corruption on earth. And you make an argument that this breach of peace represents a threat to world peace, in Islamic terms, a corruption on earth. And then the Security Council can either not authorize any military action, or the Security Council can indeed authorize military action. But yet again, for the millionth time, the United States and Britain and all the countries that supported them could not be bothered by the rules of the game that they established. They didn't bother going to the Security Council. They didn't bother having any significant or insignificant discussions in the Security Council. They didn't bother with presentation of evidence. They didn't bother with any of the legalities and directly resorted to violence again against a Muslim state. Now, of course, the United States and Britain say, well, look, these Yemenis are attacking commerce, and this is a threat to the world system. In other words, their argument is that the Yemenis are causing corruption on earth. And we have appointed ourselves as those who fight corruption on earth, al-fasad fil ard And this is why we bombed Yemen. Well, it's very interesting. Because the Yemenis have consistently argued that they are not interested in interrupting world trade or the freedom of transportation and movement in the world, that they target only ships that are Israeli, carrying the Israeli flag, or carrying merchandise to Israel. And their argument is also quite straightforward. Israel is engaging in a genocide in Gaza, and we will do everything possible to make this genocide stop. The United States didn't bother with the presentation of evidence. The United States didn't bother with arguments made by various countries like Russia or China and the Security Council. The United States didn't even bother allowing the Yemeni representative to speak for himself in the United Nations. We were not interested in what the Yemenis had to say. What we were interested in is how dare you, how dare you threaten the movement of merchandise to and from Israel. 
and we will bomb you and we will claim self-defense, an argument that any international law, any international lawyer or any international law professor knows that the self-defense argument offered by the US and Britain is utter nonsense. This is not how self-defense works. This has nothing to do with the self-defense doctrine recognized by the UN Charter. But lest we forget It wasn't that long ago when the United States itself was doing what the Yemenis did, but this time in the Persian Gulf. Some of you might remember when the US appointed itself the policeman of the Persian Gulf and stopped, searched, sometimes attacked and sunk shipping from and to Iran. And at that time, the US said, we have an absolute right to interfere with the shipping to and from an outlaw country. And if anyone dares tell us otherwise, we will fight them, we will destroy them, we will make them disappear. So the logic of the international system that we work in, apparently the US has the right to interfere with shipments to and from Cuba. Nicaragua, Iran. But if anyone dares interfere with, sh with shipping in order to bring a genocide to a stop, when it comes to the state of Israel, we will recognize no such right. And not only that, we will attack them. We will use violence against them. And we will do what Israel is doing right now and what we did when we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan and say the rules of the game do not matter. We will talk about international law when we want to say Iran is being an outlaw. We will talk about international law. We, we want to say if North Korea is being an outlaw, Cuba is being an outlaw, Venezuela is being an outlaw. But international law is entirely irrelevant when it comes to what we want to do. الفساد في الأرض Corruption on Earth Truly a fascinating concept Mind you For me There is nothing new About the hypocrisy Of the colonial states building an international order and then completely putting it aside when they want to persist in their colonial aims. But what struck me about the bombardment of Yemen is something else. Western countries led by the US in the past 20 years or so 
have made it habitual and common to use violence against Muslim states and Muslim populations. Look around the world and tell me anywhere in the world, any people in the world where the United States uses violence with absolute impunity, except against Muslims, exclusively. Violence against Muslims has become a toy, a type, a structure. It has become so institutionalized and structured and embedded that it has become part and parcel of the paradigms of Islamophobia, easily imported and utilized by all types of people all around the world against Muslims from Burma to China to India, the United States, accompanied by Israel, with their bastard baby, Islamophobia, has institutionalized in our world the idea of violence against Muslims as legitimate and reasonable and meaningful. We don't need to go to the Security Council if we're using violence against Muslims. We don't need to present evidence. We don't need to engage in arguments. But pause and think of the meaning of the thing. We notice time and time again, the West acting like a single ummah. One member of the West is threatened. The entire West reacts precisely like the Prophet ﷺ, as if a single body. The West is the fulfillment of our Prophet's description of an ummah. They are but a single body. You attack one part of the body, the entire body reacts. Canada knows that the United States has no legal right to bomb Yemen. But it doesn't matter. Because they act like a single body. So is the same with France. But it doesn't matter. Because they act like a single body. Britain has not deviated from American policy once since the 60s. Britain is always acting, having America's back, so to speak. Whatever America decides, Britain is in there to support its buddy, a single ummah a single people, the languages don't matter, the religions don't matter, nothing matters except a single strategic goal of dominating the world in the name of the West, whatever the West is, racial, ethnic, cultural, a single ummah. 
But what is the lesson affirmed and confirmed for Muslims? The lesson is remarkable and absolutely repetitive and has been the same since the days of colonialism. We get to act as a single ummah. We get to define what is corruption on earth and respond to it. You Muslims, don't you dare think to act like a single ummah. You Muslims, we can slaughter the people of Gaza and the only option that is open to you Muslims is to watch and talk about peace with us and talk about international law. India can slaughter the people of Kashmir and don't you dare Muslims act as a single ummah. You are not allowed to be a single ummah. The reason that the US and Britain bombed Yemen is because Yemen set a very, very, very dangerous precedent. Yemen was reacting to the genocide in Gaza in a way that reminds us of the idea of a single ummah. We hurt for the people of Gaza, and if you attack the people of Gaza, you are attacking us, so we will take action. And the US and its other imperial friend say, don't you dare. The Muslim ummah united you are not allowed. But wait, the ironies don't stop here. The US went out of its way to tell the world that Bahrain, ostensibly a Muslim country, helped in the bombing of Gaza. It's been the bombing of Yemen. The Saudis did what they always have done since World War II. In public, express concern, and in private, offer all the help that the US wants. So, you Muslims, remember, you are not allowed to act like a single ummah. You are not even allowed to, coordinate, to present a coordinated foreign policy, even over something so obvious like a genocide. But see, what is truly remarkable is what happens as the genocide is going on and as the United States bombs Yemen, telling Muslims, don't you dare even imagine that you can be a single ummah. Anthony Blinken comes speaking to the media and says, I've had private conversations with Muslim leaders and nothing that happened in Gaza, nothing that happened in Yemen is an obstacle to normalization of relations with Israel. I just came from talking to the Emiratis and the Saudis and the Egyptians and I don't know who else, the Moroccans, the Sudanese, 
and they all assure me the genocide is not going to hamper the Abrahamic Accords. We can keep yapping on about a meaningless concept like the two-state solution. It doesn't exist anymore. We can talk, keep talking for the next hundred years about if Israel would kindly, nicely, if they would ever allow for a Palestinian state to exist somewhere. Meanwhile, we, we spear ahead with the Abrahamic Accords and the normalization of relations between Arab countries and Muslim countries and Israel and reward Israel for its genocide. The sad thing is I completely believe Anthony Blinken when he says they are all eager to normalize relations with Gaza and the genocide doesn't matter and the bombing of Yemen doesn't matter. It is not just that you Muslims are not allowed to act like a single ummah like us, the US, Britain, Canada, France. But you Muslims can't even trust one another. We are going to embed in your very consciousness that you are traitors to one another. That you are selfish and self-centered and egocentric. These are the rulers we want for you. And this is the way we want you as a people. Muslims remain ignorant, remain stupid, remain indulgent, remain lazy and fat, remain slothless and useless on this earth. Remain. You want to add to the irony? Some of the worst massacres committed against Palestinians in Gaza are by Indian soldiers serving in the Israeli army. Indian Hindu nationalists are volunteering to fight in the Israeli army for the joy of killing Muslims. Not a single Muslim country is capable of allowing volunteers to go fight the Israelis. They wouldn't even dare of do it. Muslim countries, they wouldn't even dare to say volunteers to Gaza. But India has. India has opened the doors of volunteering and Hindu nationalists are volunteering to go fight in Gaza. There is a horrible video that some of you might have seen. Indian soldiers serving in the Israeli army after having killed a family, after having killed small Palestinian children, laughing and joking as they lay in the bed of the dead Palestinian children. They are mocking the dead Palestinians laying in the children's bed, laughing at how cute the covers are, the pillow is, and the mattress is. The children were murdered, the mother killed, and the soldiers 
in the bed laughing and joking. This is part of what Netanyahu referred to as the most moral army in the world. But what blows your mind is as Hindu nationalists openly and loudly celebrate what Israel is doing to Palestinians and saying openly and loudly Israel is giving us lessons in ethnic cleansing because this is precisely what we are going to do to Muslims in Kashmir. Thank you, Israel, for sharing intelligence with us because that's exactly what Israel is doing. Thank you for the military cooperation. We will send Hindu fanatics to fight side by side, raping and killing and murdering, because this is what we intend to do to Muslims. Because we've seen that you can commit a genocide against Muslims. Now, you want to understand more about this? Just watch C.G. Whirlman, the non-Muslim who exposes so much of this and tells us and gives us so much detail about the collusion between Israel and India as India plans the next genocide against Muslims. But in the meanwhile, not, the, not only does Antony Blinken tell us that the Ab Abraham Accords are alive and well, and that all these Muslim countries are eager to normalize, One of the most Muslim-hating individuals on the face of this earth is an Indian minister, a woman called Samariti Zubin Irani. She's the minister of women and children. She is on record calling openly for a genocide against Muslims. And as Yemen is being bombarded, and as Antony Blinken is saying to the world, Muslims don't care about the genocide. Don't worry. What happens with Samarati Zubin Irani? She is invited and welcomed by MBS in Saudi. Not only does she tweet about her visit to Saudi with film attached, but she brags that MBS allowed her to go to Mecca and Medina and be filmed outside the Prophet's mosque in Medina and outside the Kaaba in Mecca. Amazing. So wonderful. Yemen is bombed. It's genocide in Palestine. The Indians are ready for a genocide in Kashmir. And what does our great Muslim guardian of the two holy sites do not just assure Antony Blinken that nothing has changed, don't worry, keep killing the Palestinians, it's fine. But we will invite and welcome a psychotic extremist fanatic 
Indian nationalists in Mecca and in Medina and say, welcome, we love you. But here's the thing. What are Muslims busy with in the midst of all of this? Muslims choose this time to talk about, well, wait, but the Houthis are Shia. They're Zaydi. We don't care and if they support Palestine. Their support of Palestine, they're putting their lives on the line. They're allowing themselves to be killed, butchered. It's just part of a Shia conspiracy to dominate this world. They are agents of evil Iran because Iran is not a country that has been in the region forever is not a Muslim country that is part and parcel of the Muslim world. No, Iran is evil. And part of the, it's worse than Israel itself. We don't care if Hezbollah keeps attacking Israel, Israel every day and losing martyrs every day in their war to liberate their land from Israeli occupiers, mind you. At least Hezbollah is doing something. Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Emirat, what are they doing? But no. It's all an act. It is those evil Shia. The Shia once again are launching a conspiracy to kill Sunni Islam. It is true that it is Sunni Islam that produced Daesh and that Daesh never shot a single bullet against the Israeli occupation and it is true that Daesh, the Sunni Daesh, was only interested in butchering Muslims. But it is Iran and the Shia who are the real danger to our existence. A friend just showed me a journal called the Sahih. A journal distributed in Khalil, in Palestine. The journal does nothing but ignite sectarian hate amongst Muslims. The journal is dedicated to telling Sunni Muslims Hamas is pro-Shia. Don't be impressed by Hamas's resistance. Don't even sympathize with Hamas. Don't be, don't sympathize with Hezbollah. Don't sympathize with the Houthis. Because they're all Shia. And remember, oh, Sunni Muslims, there's no worse enemy to you than, God forbid, the Shia. They have their own secret Quran. They hide their own secret Quran. No one knows what is in the secret Quran, not even the Shia themselves. But it is there. Trust us. Well, the same people responsible for this majalla called Sahih that was distributed among Palestinians 
are also responsible for another very different form of distribution in Ramallah. Pornography. The Israelis, studies have shown that pornography makes men less religious. That pornography creates a problem in a in person's relationship with God. That pornography makes people have a crisis of faith. That pornography makes people pray less and think of things like martyrdom less. So the Israelis took over Palestinian channels in Khalil, took them over, and broadcasted on these channels pornography to be consumed by Palestinians. So lesson number one, hate the Shia. Lesson number two, pay attention to pornography. Lesson number three, obey the rulers. Obey Sisi of Egypt. Obey MBS. Obey MBZ. I heard on Israeli TV a ma most fascinating lecture by a former director in the Mossad. He lies out in very clear, unequivocal terms that the form of Islam that the Emiratis want, that the Saudis want, and that the Egyptians want, and that Israel wants, he says, I have traveled wide in the Muslim world. I have met all these leaders. And you know what? We are all agreed on the form of Islam that we want. We want a Jami Islam, a Madkhali Islam, a Hamza Yusuf Islam. He didn't say Hamza Yusuf, I'm adding that. But it is, in effect, what he's describing. An Islam that loves to talk about dead scholars and loves to talk about piety and the Sunnah and that loves to put on shows of beards and robes and garbs, but an Islam that is viciously sectarian, hates the Shia with a passion, hates al mubtadia the innovators, because the biggest Muttadi'ah are the Shia, and an Islam that says, whatever the ruler says goes. Because the ruler is God's shadow on earth. And don't ever defy the ruler, even if the ruler brings a Hindu genocidal nationalist to the heart of Mecca and to the heart of Medina. That a type of Islam we love. It's very good. And you know what? Trump, Sisi, and the king of Saudi Arabia already created a center for this Islam. A huge institution with a huge budget called Merkaz I'tidal. Remember that. Because Marta's i'tidal is going to play a huge role in our coming years. Marta's i'tidal does nothing night and day, funded by millions of dollars. This is the famous picture with Trump and the king of Saudi Arabia and Sisi, their, their hands on a globe. That was the opening of Marta's i'tidal. 
مركز اعتدال السعودي سكولرز ايجيبشن سكولرز يمني سكولرز اسرائيلي سكولرز امريكان زيونيس سكولرز بريتش زيونيس سكولرز فرنش زيونيس سكولرز all paid millions of dollars and مركز اعتدال اعتدال means moderation in Arabic doesn't teach اعتدال moderation when it comes to the Shia no when it comes to the Shia مركز اعتدال is affirmatively homicidal the only good Shia is a dead Shia Shia are hardly human beings. Murder them without a second thought. That's Marqaz Atidal. But what does Marqaz Atidal do? It also talks about the evils of Hamas. The evils of resistance. The goodness of scholars like Bin Bayya, Hamza Yusuf's teacher. How these are the true scholars of Islam. The evil of a Yusuf Qaradawi. The evils of a Salman Oda. The evils of all the scholars rotting in prison. And how wonderful and amazing and learned and enlightened the ones who teach obedience. Marqaz Atidal says, Muslims should not care if Israel transfers Palestinians out of Gaza or out of the West Bank. After all, it is their land. In fact, Muslims should just sacrifice, make the sacrifice, so that Israelis can feel secure and stable, and we should embrace the Israelis with open arms. And the Abraham Accords is God's true will on earth. The resistance of Hamas isn't. If you haven't been, if you haven't read the literature of Merkaz Atidal, I am not worried about the literature of Merkaz Atidal. I am worried about the millions of dollars that go out of Merkaz Atidal to sponsor scholars or semi-scholars or pseudo-scholars and imams everywhere in the United States, France, and Britain. Millions of dollars so that the US can bomb Yemen and we do not even think to pause and say, Wait, they are acting like a single ummah. What's wrong with us? Why is it that when it comes to us actually living, embodying the teaching of the Prophet والسلام, that's radical, that's fanatic, that's just not being realistic. But they can do it, and they have a right to do it. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين
Hindu nationalists are openly saying the Israelis, God bless them, are teaching us what to do about Muslims and the problem of Islam. Openly talking about how Islam is a cancer, a 1,400-year-old cancer, and that the Israelis excel in fighting this cancer, and that we must learn from them and carry out genocidal policies. You look around. Was it a Muslim nation that brought the case before the International Court of Justice? No, it was South Africa. What are the nations that joined the lawsuit against Israel and the International Court of Justice? Muslim countries? No. Has Saudi Arabia joined? No. Egypt joined? No. The Emirat joined? Absolutely not. We are busy talking about how evil the Shia is and how evil Iran is. A country that has been in the region. The Persian people have been part of this region for thousands of years. And we are talking as if somehow the Persian people came from a foreign planet. They have been in this region as old as the Arabs and as old as the Egyptians and older than the Israelis. And you better figure out a way to coexist and to live and to cooperate and to integrate them in a single ummah. Otherwise, you will remain a laughing stock to your enemy. Otherwise, genocides will continue being perpetrated against Muslims decade after decade after decade. And then non-Muslim countries like South Africa would be the ones to vindicate the rights of Muslims and what is the collective effect of all of that on the Muslim psyche, on that feeling of being defeated and a broken people. I read the news item. The Israeli Zionist organizations have marked a hundred million dollars to be spent in this coming election. I read articles about a very important book, two volume book that came out. It's called One Nation Under Blackmail that details how what has, who has been described as Israel's super spy, Robert Maxwell, and his daughter, Jelaine Maxwell, and the pedophile, Epstein, have dedicated all their efforts on creating 
a files of sexual improprieties to blackmail leaders, Muslim leaders and non-Muslim leaders. Everyone from Trump to Clintons to MBS to the entire entire what of the Emirati government offering them the most beautiful women then filming them having sex with the most beautiful women and because these women are underage then blackmailing them for Israel's best interest I read there is a book called Return to Mecca by a man called Dennis Avi Lipkin. Lipkin is an American citizen and an Israeli fanatic who openly says Israel should not just be a Rex Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates, but the only way Israel can be safe is if in due time we occupy Mecca and Medina itself. Lipkin has published books, created organizations in Israel, gives lectures attended by hundreds and thousands. His books are bestsellers because Israelis support their authors, unlike us. You can't get a Muslim to just spend money, $10, $20, in supporting a book. But Lipkin, is supported by millions of dollars. And I remember reading in the diaries of Theodore Herzl how he complained about how his Zionist dream was such an outlier and how Jews would always ignore him and consider him a dreamer and just out there. And Lipkin, in his writing, says the same things. Yeah, I know that right now, the majority of Zionists don't buy it. That the only way we can truly be safe in this region is to embrace the idea of becoming a superpower. These countries, Lipkin says, in a book that you can buy and you can read, but I know that Muslims don't buy books and don't read. In his book, Return to Mecca, he says, we know that these are paper armies. We can defeat the Egyptian army in two days. They're corrupt to the core. They don't even know how to use the weapons they own. The thing they worry about the most is sending their kids to school and filling their bellies. We know this about the Egyptians, and we know this about the Jordanians, and we know this about the Syrians. And in due time, we should overrun all this territory and end the cancer of Islam once and for all. The cancer of Islam remind you of a theme? The same thing you're hearing from Hindu nationalists. The same thing we heard from Serbian fanatics and war criminals as they opened up the rape camps of Bosnia. The same thing we heard from the Burmese military as they slaughtered thousands of Rohingyas. The same thing we are hearing from the Chinese officials 
as they harvest the organs of Muslims. Anyone, any of you, that indulges in a single moment of Shia Sunni rhetoric is a traitor to God and his prophet. You are an absolute traitor. Any of you that indulges in a single moment of calling someone who tells you to obey the criminal rulers that couldn't even join South Africa in a lawsuit for genocide, for God's sake. For God's sake. The guardian of the two holy sites brings in a Hindu criminal nationalist to our holy sites. And yet, so many of you still insist on saying, Sheikh Hamza, he's Sheikh Hamza. Don't call him Hamza Yusuf, call him Sheikh Hamza. You are a traitor to God and his prophet. Khalas, there is no room. You are a traitor. Any of you that do not understand the idea of it Muslims as a cancer, as a common enemy to every genocidal element in this world, from the Hindus of India to the criminals of China to the criminals in Burma. You are a traitor to Allah and his prophet. You are not a brother. You are not a sister. You are part of the facade in this earth. You are part of those criminals who tolerate corruption on earth through their indulgences and through their vanities and through their ignorance. May Allah have mercy on all of us. Allahumma hafu anna. Allahumma arhamna. اللهم اغفر لنا يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر مجاهدين غزة يا الله يا رب اللهم احفظ أهل غزة اللهم اكرمهم اللهم أيدهم حتى ينالوا حريتهم يا رب العالمين الله forgive our sins الله help us to become better Muslims to become true Muslims الله aid the Mujahideen in Gaza who are resisting Israel and Israeli genocide. Allah have mercy on the victims of Gaza. Allah protect us from our own ignorance and the plans of facade, of corruption that are being woven to murder more Muslims and more Muslims around the world. Allah you are the merciful one. We are the sinners. Help us, Ya Rabb. Help us. Help us to free ourselves from our own ignorance. Ya Allah, Ya Ali, Ya Azim. Wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad. Wa ala alih wa ashabih. Wa man ittaba'u bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. Wa aqim as-salah.